Our topic today is the theory of conservation. Darwin had a subtitle to his major work, and I do as well. It's on the likelihood that purely naturalistic and mechanistic processes inhibit major evolutionary change. This, ladies and gentlemen, may be my last lecture. <laughs> this lecture is inspired by the words and works of a number of people, and if you happen not to see your name on the list, it's not that I haven't been greatly influenced by your work, it's just that I'm in enough trouble with these people. <laughs> I would also like to give special thanks to the National Academy of Scientism. Oh, I, uh, I, I'm, <laughs> there goes my grant. We're not taping this, are we? We are. Oh. Well, I'd like to honor my, my second grade teacher at this point in time by saying that whenever you introduce a new term, that you define it and use it in a sentence. Unfortunately, I use the Reader's Digest version of a dictionary, and it says, see materialism. So when we look up the word materialism, we find it to mean the doctrine that everything in the world, including thought, can be explained only in terms of matter. There was a second definition that said something about uh, lack, lack of concern about things spiritual or intellectual, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> Richard Lewinton on materialism. This is the sentence. My second grade teacher didn't say that I had to use my sentence. <laughs> I'm going to use his sentence. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. I, I'm not making this up. These are his actual words. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. There, Mrs. Nakamura, is your sentence. But he continues, it is not that the methods and the institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, I agree with Professor Lewinton that when it comes to the operation of things that have been, dare I use the C word here, that have been created or that exist already, that we do not call upon the divine hand to explain that. However, when it comes to the subject of origins, I think we must leave the door open. Douglas Fatuma on materialism. Darwin showed that material causes are a sufficient explanation not only for physical phenomena, as Descartes and Newton had shown, but also for biological phenomena with all their seeming evidence of design and purpose. By coupling undirected purposeless variation to the blind, uncaring process of natural selection, Darwin made theological or spiritual explanations of life processes superfluous. Together with Marx's materialistic theory of history and society and Freud's attribution of human behavior to influences over which we have little control, Darwin's theory of evolution was a crucial plank in the platform of mechanism and materialism, of much of science in short, that has been the stage of most Western thought. Now, I know what you're thinking. Marx, Freud, Darwin, two down, one to go. <laughs> but before the end of this talk, I think you will find that Darwin is the hero of the story. More to come. Materialism 
if I can interpret the two previous quotes correctly, maybe summed up by this statement. I believe that absolutely everything came into existence out of absolutely nothing with absolutely no reason and for absolutely no purpose. This is uh, for the physicists. Now for the, ph <laughs> the philosophers have a corollary. I further believe that there are absolutely no absolutes. <laughs> Materialism, noun, leads us to this question. How can the origin of time, space, matter, and energy be explained without reference to pre-existing time, space, matter, and energy? Another way of asking the question is, who put the material in materialism? <laughs> I knew that you'd want an answer to that, so I, I went to the, the person that put the material in materialism last week, and I asked.